नमस्कार एन इम्पॉर्टेंट क्वेश्चन विच मे बी वर्थ कॉन्टेम्पलेटिंग फॉर एवरी वन स्पेशली फॉर दोज हु आर ऑन द स्पिरिचुअल पाथ इज वॉट इज ईगो इफ वी गो टू द डिक्शनरी मीनिंग we find that ego means a person's sense of self esteem or importance and other synonyms that come to mind are self worth self respect self conceit self image and self confidence so it's it's worth examining where this self image or self worth comes from and we can start looking at ourselves here and now and the first image that comes to mind or we associate ourselves with is the physical form we have been saddled with and this physical form is here with us for good until we finally decide to leave this world and go so if the physical form or the physical body is good and shiny and if because of it we are noticed and appreciated by others we feel proud of it we carry our bodies as our prized possessions or shields but if it is not so we are shy and diffident when approaching others the body obviously starts breeding lack of confidence now look at it more deeply did any of us have the ability to control or decide what kind of body he or she would be born with no the body we have inherited springs from a play of genes of our ancestors over which we did not have any conscious control and yet we give so much of importance to the body just because we identify with it we can start looking at other aspects of our existence so what gives us a sense of who we truly are you can take your pick but what easily comes to my mind is ancestry family traditions caste religion culture language nationality and each of these things are what we have been born into and the family and society drills us or drills these identities into us firmly and so these become a very dominant a part of who we think we are and apart from the things that we have inherited there are those things that we create or acquire in this life through our own effort so we invest time and energy into education into learning certain life skills and these establish us into our respective vocations or professions or jobs 
and these in turn give rise to our wealth our position in society our recognition and all this while we are continually acting with the environment we are in so if the outcome is according to our expectations or even goes beyond it we are quick to declare ourselves to be successful we take credit for our achievements and we start carrying a sense of superiority over others and if it does not happen if failures come our way we find ways to discover or even invent where to put the blame for what we have not been able to achieve and god forbid if for some reason we start associating ourselves with our failures we begin to berate and belittle ourselves in our own eyes no sense of self worth remains and apart from this there is our emotional self a curious mix of our expectations our ideologies our belief systems our fears and it is this space from which many of our judgments our strong likes and dislikes arise and this is where our relationships are either made or marred so we can list the package of identities of who we think we are physical body ancestry religion culture nationality education skill sets belief systems opinions our worldly attainments our expectations from others and ourselves our future aspirations our hopes even our favorite fears and nightmares and we can go on and on the list would be endless and this cumulative package is our ego and we are holding on to ego as dear life and it is the filter through which we perceive ourselves and this world no wonder whatever we see is far from what it actually is because of the ego we cannot see the reality what we see is but an image a sketch drawn and colored by our ego and sometimes the filter of the ego is so strong and it breeds such strong traits of personality that are not easy to break or let go i can i can share something with you from my in service days training that happened some 45 years ago the training had just ended and i was going out on my first field posting i went to take leave of one of our trainers for whom i had developed great respect and admiration and he told me something 
when we were parting. He said, you are going to be in contact with members of the public and their representatives. So it is very important that you maintain your distance. Make it a habit of not to smile or to appear too friendly. Always maintain an air of seriousness. As I said, he was somebody whom I admired. So I took his advice to heart. I became serious and unsmiling. I developed a suspicion of all strangers. And over the years, it became a dominant personality trait. Though I was open and forthcoming before friends and family, I would be totally tongue-tied, silent and somewhat sullen or un uncommunicative before those whom I did not know. Now it so happened that some 15 years later, in my Guru's ashram, I was given the seva of being the master of ceremonies at a program. Some celebration was going on and there was a huge crowd. I was expected to go to the podium, look at people and welcome everyone with a huge smile. I just couldn't do it. The unsmiling, serious person within me was not going to smile so easily. So when the program started and I took my place at the podium, I just looked at this crowd and froze. Great resentment arose from within me. Fear too. I didn't want to be there. And given the option, I would have just run away and ducked out of sight. I was so afraid to make even eye contact with those people whom I knew. So I was just seeing through this crowd. A few moments passed. There was silence. And it seemed like eternity. And only then, I mustered up all my courage, somehow opened my mouth and said, Welcome everyone. It was more like an office command. Obviously, I was holding on to the serious bureaucrat within me with all my might. I had used the word welcome, but there was no welcome in my voice or my demeanor. The program was great, but my hosting had been a disaster and also a dampener. 
standing there at the podium, I felt I was facing death. And it is so true. Even though it is just a filter, the ego convinces us that it is the reason for our very existence. And each time, even a tiny fragment of it is threatened one way or the other. It feels as if one is facing death. Carrying my story forward, I must mention that I was lucky to have some very, very help. I was lucky to have some very compassionate tutors at the ashram. Though I never wanted to be part of another program. After the disaster I had faced, they persisted with me. And I kept getting drafted for the programs at the ashram. One of my tutors, a lady, devised a unique method to unfreeze me. She chose to sit in the front row, program after program, and had a pact with me. Each time our eyes met, she would give me a smile and say, cheese. And I had to smile back at her. And finally I learned to go of my limited concept of always living like a serious bureaucrat. I learned to smile before strangers. Something else also changed. I learned to look into people's eyes while speaking to them. Previously, I was just talking at them. I even started relishing their reactions. And this was no ordinary breakthrough. At one level, the mind, which is the seat of the ego, had been transcended. And I was able to rise above my limiting concept of a self-conscious person. I was able to bring my heart into my dealings with people. And it transformed my life in other ways too. Petty rivalries at the workplace simply disappeared. I became more accepting of others and others became more accepting of me. And for many at the workplace, I became a trusted friend, a comrade, and sometimes even a mentor. As I underwent this transformation, I learned something remarkable. Each time we let go of a filter of ego, we experience enhanced freedom. The ego is, however, very clever. It knows how to repackage itself and present itself in more acceptable 
and subtler ways. So while it is considered that the man of the world is afflicted by ego, the spiritual man is also not a stranger to it. Often the spiritualist feels that he is superior to those who are not yet on the path. Or even amongst the spiritualists, one might feel that his path is the highest. All this is the work of the ego. In its, its uh, sub subtlest form, ego might arise in this thought, Oh my God, I have no ego. <laughs> so, in spirituality, it's very important to analyze and understand the ego. Only then, we can hope to rise above it. So every moment we have to be aware of the identity statements that we are using. Who and what we think we are. And this can provide access to us to the inner recesses of our, of our subconscious mind where all our identity statements and all our belief systems come from. Where all our thoughts and habit patterns are stored. So when we contemplate our identity statements, we make one startling discovery. Every identity statement or every identity statement arises from memory, which is a matter of conditioning within the boundaries of time, place and space and belief systems. And this conditioning can change. So, while we may be bound by what we think we are, we can change the conditioning by becoming more aware of that part within us, the pure I am, the Shuddha Aham Vimarsh, the unchanging eternal self that remains within us permanent and steadfast. It is that part of us that can take any identity but is not bound by it. So we can learn to operate from this space of the pure I am. And as we do this, we become more and more conscious and aware of the conditioning that is working within us at a given point of time. So when a thought or a behavioral pattern rooted in conditioning, rears its head, we need not flow with it. We can cultivate an attitude of the witness. Just take a pause. Watch the conditioning. And then make a conscious choice. 
how to act. We become rooted in response and not reaction. Because the conditioning has a strong hold, it is not easy. It is a challenge. But it is the way. The way of the spiritualist. And the meditators discover a, a far more potent weapon against ego. They draw their awareness inside, become still, and try and find the gap. the gap between two consecutive breaths or the gap between two consecutive thoughts. And in this gap, pure awareness is resting within itself. So, in this gap, there is no ego, <clears throat> because all the filters of the ego have been bypassed. They have been given a go-by. And the more one gets into this gap awareness, the lesser he or she is going to be in the clutches of the ego. In the annihilation, or maybe we can call it release, the release of ego. In this release, there is resurrection or rebirth. The sense of having become a dwij, a twice born, the path the traveler, and the goal, all three merge into one. It is the way whereby we can someday live a life free from ego. <laughs> However, until that happens, the ego is our teacher. We cannot discard it and we must learn to work our way through it. So these were some thoughts on the ego. Thank you for watching this video. May God bless you all.